Hello and welcome to the Mixed Bag. This is the podcast where we discuss topics ranging from 2001, A Space Odyssey, to 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. My name is Zach Martin. I'm a co-host of this podcast. You can find me on Sanity of a College Student at blogspot.com. With and me hi. is... Hi, uh, I'm, I'm Sean Barnes, and uh, you can find me at dumbledore.blogspot.com. Um, and today we're going to be talking about uh, a, a nice a nice breadth of subjects. Uh, we're going to be starting out by talking about the trailer for the new, newest Quentin Tarantino film, Django Unchained. Then we're going to be moving into a discussion about Star Trek, uh, where it should be going in the next generation of television. Then we're going to be moving on to a short talk about a subject that is very personal to all bronies out there, bro hoof represent and then we're going to be finishing up with a long-winded discussion about the last two seasons of game of thrones all right uh so first up we're going to be watch we're going to watch uh we're going to watch the trailer for Django unchained which is the way uh we're going to start all our podcasts from now on is by watching a movie trailer or and, something uh, with a video a trailer most likely though because they come out so damn often yeah and we're both big movie nerds so so deal with it Okay, we're going to be, uh, I know two trailers have been uh, released for this. We're going to be watching the U.S. Uh, trailer, that is the teaser. Uh, you know, people say it's a teaser, but if it, it has a runtime of two, two minutes, 15, two minutes, 20 seconds, I'm sorry, but that's a trailer. You yeah, know, that's a, that's a teaser is usually a minute, minute and a half, so I don't care what they say. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we're gonna we're, just so you know that we're gonna link all the content that we're gonna be watching and talking about uh, as best we can under our uh, under our videos and on any page that they're on. All and right. For those of you who have a computer, you can look up you know the link like Sean said. But if you don't have a computer, we're also gonna be including the audio so you can listen along. Uh, if this is your first time viewing this trailer, please stop and watch the trailer because the audio really does not do it justice. I mean, it's some good audio, but it's good audio. But if you listen, <laughs> like, or you're about to see, you'll you'll see. Okay. All right. So what we're gonna do is, uh, I'm gonna count us off three, two, one. Uh, then me and Zach are both gonna hit play and watch, and we we might comment here and there, uh, but we'll try and not just talk over it. All right. Uh, three, two, one, play. The following preview has been approved for appropriate audiences. There ain't no grave can hold my soul. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. Best way to start a trailer. It's good scenery. Oh yeah. Don't all westerns have good scenery? Gentlemen. Do you see the tooth now? A monster inventory has been led to believe the yes. specimen I'm keen to acquire. <laughs> when I hear oh, he's talking about black people, ain't he? I'm on a ride right out of the ground. Django. Then you're exactly the one I'm looking for. Hey, drop. <laughs> Stop talking to him. Calm down. I'm simply a customer trying to conduct a transaction. Last chance, fancy pants. Oh, very well. Boom and shot! Do you know what a bounty hunter is? This is going to be a funky western, let's just say that. I'm going to give you a reward. Hmm, better they are, bigger the reward. I need your help. I'm looking for the Brittle Brothers. Oh, this is probably going to be everything Wild Wild West was supposed to be. Without the giant spider? Don't you? <laughs> Mine's the giant debunk spider. Sold it, but I don't know who to. Oh, that crap! That sold me right there. Visit yeah. Every that that one run. shot just Once sold me on this movie. Oh, dude, the, the same thing dust. happened with me in the I Great Gatsby trailer. <laughs> and I'll take you to rescue your wife. Where are we going? Yes! I kind of want to go see this on Christmas. I am going to see this on Christmas. I love this song right here. Coconut milk. <laughs> Spray. How do you like the bounty hunting business? Kill white folks and they pay you for it? What's not the light? I like the way you like die, the way you die, boy. He <laughs> is a rambunctious sword, ain't he? <laughs> so. What's your name? Wait, here comes the catchphrase. Django. The D is silent. Hold on. 
So is anybody else out, out there ready for uh, Red Fox Redemption? Red Fox Redemption? I mean, I, and that's all I can think of because the, that's that's the last Western thing I can think of in, in recent pop culture that was really enjoyable. And I think this is going to be the next big one. What, what, um, what, what, Red Dead Redemption. I was making a double reference to uh, Red Fox and Jamie Foxx, you uh, oh. Philistine. Um, oh. Anyway. My dorky jokes aside, uh, what did you think of that trailer, Zach? Well, I don't know. I just, I don't know. Oh, f yes, I'm excited for this. Are you kidding me? I mean, okay, I, I don't know if anyone knows this out there, but Quentin Tarantino is my favorite director. It's like, whatever he's doing, I'm there. You think he's an auteur? Of his, yeah, yeah, his, I really his own do. Movies like like he he like writes, directs, and and stars in his movies, and it's it's all like like he makes his movies. They're all him. Yeah, and, and they all have their own style, and they all uh, they're all fantastic. I mean, I know some people don't like Jackie Brown, but if you give Jackie Brown a second chance, knowing okay, it's no Pulp Fiction. Even the best directors have a bad movie here and there. Yeah, but Jackie Brown's not bad. Well, you know what I mean. Fact, a lot a of people uh, like sorry, him. a uh, 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 not necessarily classic film. Yeah, I think his lowest is Death Proof, but Death Proof has Death Proof has one of the best car chase sequences ever, which is always a plus. I mean, um, I, the, mean, the I is great with dialogue and writing, and I'm currently reading this script. Sue me, I don't care. Uh, this trailer just absolutely got me interested in the film. And by the way, for those people out there that don't want to see this trailer because they think that it might give away spoilers and stuff, absolutely not. No way does this give spoilers. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It didn't even come close. You know, uh, the it's 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 really interesting. Like I, I really like Tarantino's films, uh, Inglorious Bastards, uh, Kill Bill. Like all of these films. Like uh, you go, like even like even the ones that are kind of like uh, what's the vampire movie? <laughs> Oh, uh, from Dust Till Dawn. Yeah, even from Dust Till Dawn, that are kind of like more on the B movie side. They're all really interesting films. They're all really unique films. Even though what they what he does is he takes ideas from all of these other films and he kind of rewraps them in this kind of like well written package. Yeah, that makes and they're sense. They're always highly entertaining. They're always, you know, you can see where the inspiration came from, but he's homaging it and innovating at the same time. Which is why I like him. It's just I mean, I'd go gay for I would go gay for Quentin Tarantino. Whoa, whoa! Uh, I, don't, I don't care. So 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 let's see what 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 do we got for a cast in this movie? Well, uh, we have Jamie Fox. Yep. I wonder who he's playing. I have no idea. I think it's. Jamie. <laughs> uh, we also have Christoph Waltz making his second return. Ooh. That's a bingo. Oh <laughs> from God! Or his bastards. People saying, "Oh, well, he's playing the same character." No, he's not. No, he's not. It's, he does have a because he's accent. German. He has exactly. a German accent, but because he's German no. and he's a badass. That I mean, makes this him guy the same is character. like this guy is like the smartest motherfucker you will ever see on film, according to the Mace script. Windu. <laughs> Mace Windu and. and uh... <laughs> I don't even know. Just say, it's like it's like saying every character Samuel Jackson plays is the same character. Well, Samuel no. Jackson is actually in this film. Well, I'm a mushroom cloud laying motherfucker, motherfucker. Every time my fingers touch brain, I'm super fly TNT. I'm the guns of the Navarone. Just because, yeah, of course he's, he's in this nowhere film. in the trailer, but like, he's in the film. He's not. No, he's not. He doesn't show up in, in this trailer. He's gonna have some of a cameo, I'm sure. Um, well, they feature probably, him in the international. Might be a narrator or something. That could be cool. Yeah, the, the script does call for a narrator. As I was gonna say, Western films usually have those kind of characters. Um, and then, of course, uh, the, the character we both said, w like, you were sold when you saw him. Uh, yeah, there's this, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, there is this shot in the trailer where it's a zoom-in rack focus on uh, Leonardo DiCaprio smiling and blowing smoke out of his nose and just nodding. It's just, he's playing a bad guy. I know, he's playing a bad guy, but I have my paycheck here sitting beside of me. I just keep throwing it at the screen. Nothing's happening. Okay, oh, no. it's just... <laughs> nothing is happening. Shut up and take my money! So just we've got, like, the all my money. storm, dude. I mean, we've got, like, all these actors who are who are awesome. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I mean, like, I don't know, but for, for you, for me, uh, DiCaprio just like he stole, he stole my like he, he gained like everything. Nothing could after after Inception, he could do like awful movies for the rest of his life, and I would still like him. Oh, absolutely. He's a likable. Uh, he's a likable actor. He's no Tom Cruise or something. No, uh, but I think he's a better actor than Tom Cruise. Um, here, here. <laughs> I see what you did there. Just throwing that out there. Uh, and Throw him under the bus while you're at Tom Cruise. Don't worry, I don't think he listens to our podcast. So, I mean, that's uh, and there's not really that much more to say about this movie trailer besides the fact that I think I'm gonna go see it. I mean, are you gonna go see it opening day, opening week, next week? I usually don't go see movies opening day unless, like I said, I've said la- I think I said last podcast. They're like something that I'm like, I'm dying to see, like I'm dying to see this, but I'm I'm usually. Uh, I spend a lot of money on DVDs and other t- and video games, so I don't have that much money to go to the theater every week. <laughs> See, for me, I'm planning on getting a friend of mine who also loves Mr. QT, and we're going out Christmas Day. Okay, I don't care if I have to work. That's cool. I'm going Christmas Day. This is my second most anticipated film. Yeah. Uh, Dark Knight Rises is, of course, number one, which we will cover here. Don't worry, people. We're going to cover it. Uh, but there, you, you know, know this just I mean, this just looks like a tour de force of awesome. Yep, and uh, just like I said, um, yeah, I'm definitely gonna see this now. Uh, just throwing this out here, uh, we're definitely looking for any comments for how to improve our podcast or what, what to talk about. And uh, I definitely would like to hear some comments about what movie trailers you want us to talk about next week. Um, I'm thinking maybe The Great Gatsby. Or maybe we could talk about uh, was it Moon? What's the new uh, new Anderson film? Oh, Mo- uh, uh, Moonrise Kingdom. That might be a fun trailer to talk about because I'm a big fan of his films. So yeah. Um, alrighty then. Uh, with with that resolved, uh, you ready to move on to the next subject? Um, uh, sure. Are you sure I can't suck his dick just a little bit longer? No. So <sighs> let's move on to Star Trek. So, I, uh, I've been, today we're talking about two different, uh, types of fandoms and two different types of series that I got into around the same time last year. And, uh, I can officially say I'm a Trekker. Um, I a think Trekkie? you call yourself, uh, you call yourself a Trekkie or a Trekkie is the, it's kind of like the term that, uh, people call Trekkers, call Trekkies. It's kind of like, it's almost, there's almost an insulting bit to it. A trekker has kind of more of a dignified, I don't know, experience to it. I don't know. You can use either term. Okay. Uh, but uh, I've watched. Uh, I've, I've since since I started watching this probably last summer. Uh, I watched all the movies last summer, and then I started watching uh, Next Generation. I'm now on Voyager. Um, thank you, Netflix. Uh, <laughs> and I have to say, I, I am a trekker, and I want to talk about uh, the the future of Star Trek. Um, well, I think we've all seen the uh, the recent Star Trek film that came out a couple years ago. Um, if you haven't, well, that's okay. It only grossed what, two hundred fifty million, something like that. 300? It did pretty good for a yeah, Star Trek. Yeah, it did really movie. good. And I remember going to see it. Uh, I believe it was the second weekend of its release. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't really looking forward to it. It was just a thing to do. My sister wanted to go see it and. You know, from the viewpoint of someone who's seen a few episodes of the original series and a, maybe one or two of Next Gen, and that's it. Uh, of course, I've seen Rathacon, but I think that's the only tr- uh, Star Trek film I've seen. This was a lot of fun for me, uh, and I enjoyed it. I do own it on Blu-ray, and... Um, Idea, we should watch all the films at some point together. All the films? Yeah. I've heard first, some of them first... are bad. And yeah, but that's the fun part. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> that, Star Trek is like Star Trek is like any fandom. There are good times and there are bad times. 
Maybe um, we should do a live commentary track. Oh, maybe. Um, but but yeah. Uh, so the movie was pretty good. It was pretty successful too. I think people generally liked it. Um, uh, and the reason that I thought about talking about it is because at the recent E3, one of the games that I saw that I was kind of interested in was the new Star Trek game, which is branching the last Star Trek film to the next Star Trek film. In the game, uh, you play as a you play as Kirk and uh, Spock, and you're, it's a co-op game, and you're fighting against the Gorn, which are if you've ever if you've ever seen that scene where uh, where Captain Kirk William Shatner. Uh, fights this big ugly alien thing and it's a really bad fight scene oh it's considered to be the worst fighting scene ever it's just yeah it's, it's the worst those choreographed the shit guys. you've ever seen yeah those are the bad guys in the, in the new video game but believe it or not they're a lot faster and a lot more intimidating in the video game well of but, course uh, if they were the same in the video game everybody would be complaining for a refund and laughing at it, <laughs> i.e. Duke Nukem Forever. I've got balls of steel. I, I would buy it. Um, but yeah, so basically, yeah, there's the, Star Trek uh, has a lot of things going for it right now, but there hasn't been a new Star Trek show to, uh, to debut since 2001. The last one went off air in 2005. And it, it really it really is kind of baffling as to why there isn't any talk about making a new Star Trek show because there have been some really popular genre shows over the last couple of years. So so that's what that's our main subject today is uh, why isn't there a Star Trek show? What we'd like to see in a Star Trek show? It should there be a Star Trek show, etc. Well, here's the here's the problem. What do you do for a Star Trek show? Do you go for the new 2009 film? Well, no, it's definitely going to be – It's. Uh, I think I think the first thing we can say is that I think if they make a new show, it should be set in that universe. Mm -hmm. uh, because if, if you watch the film, spoiler – it's not really a big spoiler. They create an alternate the, timeline. The film has been out for three years, okay? So the film, the film starts as kind of a prequel to the original Star Trek series. It's about how Kirk and uh, his crew met up on the Enterprise, except in the film – uh, there, there's a scene where uh, they get to meet Spock from another time, and by the end of the film, he's from another timeline, uh, which really doesn't make sense with the way that Star Trek time travel stories usually work. But that's not really the point. The point is that J.J. Abrams was—it's a pretty cool idea to split the universe, is because it gives him so much room to create, and really, it gives the—it gives so much more potential for them to create a new series. In any in any position in the timeline, they don't have to worry about it matching up with uh, with other series. They can make nods to the other series, and that's kind of a cool thing. They make nods to the characters from the other series, and that'll be fun. Um, so the question is, why isn't there a show? So, um, I've I, I've read some articles about this recently, um, and I've heard some different people's opinions, uh, and I kind of I think I've talked about this before. The fact that uh, the main reason that this isn't gonna, there isn't a new series right now, is because they, the people that own the rights to Star Trek, don't want to make a new series. They're worried about it messing up uh, the movie franchise because people, they're worried about people getting confused. And mm -hmm. if you really want to see where that's happening a lot in television right now, the best place to look would be like the new, since uh, since Marvel uh, properties have now been owned by Disney. A lot of the the, the the a lot of the Marvel shows that were playing before Marvel acquired, uh, before Marvel was acquired by Disney, are canceled. For example, uh, the most recent Avengers cartoon series, which I've watched all the episodes to because I really enjoyed those kinds of shows, was canceled, in in preference for a new cartoon show, uh, made by Disney that falls in line with the with the movies. Believe it or not, the same thing happened with a recent series of Transformers because they were worried about messing up with the, the t they're worried about confusing the audience. It's like they're gonna watch the TV show and they're gonna be like, "Well, I'm confused because I'm stupid." Well, I mean, you are dealing with the lowest common denominator with your, uh, with your audience, which you know the red letter media reviews do explain. You are, you know, this is, uh, what's the term they use? And you know, it wasn't gonna be for us geeks. It was gonna be for the popcorn-eating, dim-witted masses, so they can make a bunch of cash. So the main reason that we don't have a new Star Trek show is that they're they're too worried to take the risk, because they think America is stupid. That that's it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, um, 
they they did say out. most screenplays were written uh, for an eight-year-old audience. I'm sorry, eighth grade. Like, well, you know that. I mean, we could get into the the whole the whole theories behind writing television. But what we, what I'd like to talk about more, what I'd like to see in a new show. Now, the shows we've had so far, we just do a quick rundown. Uh, we have the original series, which of course starred William Shatner, uh, Nimoy, uh, you know, all these amazing people uh, that have kind of become heroes in science fiction uh, and genre uh, fandoms. Uh, it was it was a show that was kind of it was of its time. It had a lot of really interesting stories. It was nice that it brought sci-fi to TV, but it was also very very uh, cheesy. And you can argue that all the Star Trek series kind of have this cheesy factor to it, but that's just based on the the. It's usually more about the uh, the quality of the acting or about the uh, the production values. Well, it was but also they, about it, the main message of the story and not really... Like, this isn't, you know, Game of Thrones where they get, you know, $20 million. No, the, the, the point of uh, Star Trek is that it's about inspiring people to uh, new frontiers. Exactly. Space. The final um, frontier. I think the main reason that the original series was so influential is because the people say that they, they've, you know... Star Trek inspired them to, to take their career into science or to take their, you know, whatever. It inspired them to do all these things because it makes you think. Uh, and then uh, a few, you know, and then the 1980s were introduced to John luc Picard of the Star Trek Enterprise. Which and... then the question becomes Kurt versus Picard. And for me, I'm a Picard guy. I'm a Picard guy too because I'm pretty cerebral, cerebral but, uh, eh. Well, it's but yeah, uh, Next Generation was a far, was it definitely con- it continues the spirit of the original series. Um, it focuses mostly on uh, trying to uh, meet new life and exploring different philosophies within that s- series. That's mostly what it was about. Most of the, like I said, most of their problems were resolved with diplomacy. There was occasionally some pretty serious action, but I'd say Next Generation so far has been probably been my favorite series. Then we had Deep Space Nine, which was a series about a space station next to a wormhole uh, that was kind of caught between a war between all these different factions over uh, several years. Um, it was a very cool series. Um, it had a lot of interesting characters. Uh, then we, if That one was more of a war story most of the time. Then we have Voyager. Now, Voyager is where you can kind of see a lot of the problems coming with the Star Trek TV series because it's very techno babbly. It's all they they saw like they talk about the way that each doctor solves things differently. Each not doctor, each uh, captain solves things differently, and in Voyager they solve their problems with uh, science. And and then when our last series we have, which is people blame the last series for ruining Star Trek or messing up Star Trek, but I don't really have an opinion on it because I haven't seen it yet. But that one is a prequel to the original uh, series, um, and it is about. It's kind of like a guy. It's kind of just another Star Trek series, but you know, I, I'll admit, I don't know a lot about enterprise, but the point is, so there's, there's been, there's been a variety of different shows with different settings and different characters. Um, and they've tried to tell very different stories. There's a different tone to each of the series. I think it's very subtle, but it's there. Um, so the question is, what does a new Star Trek show need to have? Uh, a, a new tone, B, a new direction, C, new characters, D, new sets. And, well, these are all obvious, but like, yeah. <laughs> well, that's I mean, like, that. what would you like to see take place in this kind of, what would you like to see take place? Would you like it to be just like, just like one of the older series where it's about people going to explore an unknown frontier or do you want to have it like take place in one location? Um, that is a very good question. The question is, what do the fans want? I think that do the fans want a retread of something that's already been done or do they want something new? Personally, I, I I'm more of a fan of seeing what would happen if we we use today's uh, today's basically today's production values mixed with today's like philosophies almost I want to say uh, because like like I said each of the Star Trek shows are definitely a a sign of their times like Next Generation was had a lot of New Age stuff because it took place in the late 80s and the early in the 90s mm-hmm. so like it it has a lot to do with like it's very politically correct ish. Like it, it to almost to the point of like, sometimes they're way too, uh, on the nose. 
Well, no, I feel like I feel like in the in a lot of the, the Star Trek series that were out in the '90s and in the early 2000s, try way too hard to be respectful in situations that you wouldn't normally. People wouldn't act that way. <laughs> no matter how far in the future this is, it's it's they they're like I don't know. It's 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 difficult to explain uh, how to. I basically it's we want to see a more maybe a more gritty Star Trek. I almost want to say. I, the main thing I'd have to say though is that the series should definitely be optimistic. I think that's one of the, the best things about Star Trek. Star Trek is usually pretty optimistic. Well, I I sure hope they be optimistic. I mean, isn't that what you know uh, Star Trek's all about? Kind of. It's it's yeah. It's about a brighter tomorrow. Exactly. So I sure hope they be optimistic. Yeah. Uh. I. What. What do you think the next captain should be like? Because that's always an important thing. So we've had we've had uh, we've had Mr. Had some Suave. White, we've had some white guys who were kind of hetero. We had one who was we had the guy who was you know Mr. Suave. Then we had the guy who was Mr. Intellectual. Uh, then in Deep Space Nine, we have a, a war veteran. Uh, he's kind of an engineer. And uh, what I liked about Cisco was that he broke all the rules. Uh, and then Voyager, we've got a scientist. She's a scientist, so she's and, and she's a female. So we have a, a, our first woman captain. Uh, so I guess the question is, is uh, do we want to see? Like I kind of like. Is it going to take? Maybe this should take some of their tips from British sci-fi, and maybe have their first gay captain. Or at least bisexual captain. Yeah, but again, you're gonna piss off so many people because because fuck you, that's why. <laughs> but I mean, uh, you know, I, I I see what you're saying. Uh, but I think that the show it, it it could do well if they cancel if they do those appropriately. Um, it's it's all about how they do it. Um, like I said, in a lot of British sci-fi television, there's a lot of homosexual characters, uh, and I think. It makes sense that if it's set in the future, there would be a lot of not necessarily homosexual and heterosexual, but just like characters of all different types of gender uh, identities. If that makes sense. Yeah, to where it's a more broad spectrum, you know, you know, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, they they very rarely mentioned any. I don't. I can't really remember a lot of. Hom- I can't really remember many heter- homosexual characters from uh, any of the series I've watched. There's been a couple here and there. But it doesn't really make sense that in the future and in the great vastness of the galaxy and, or of the universe that there would be just like everyone's ahead. There's, a, there's men and women. That's the, I guess that's the other big thing is, and what I liked about the film is, the Star Trek aliens can't just be aliens with like, you know, a little bit of putty on their face. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's way too cheesy and pretty much unforgivable. I think you can, I think that's the, the, the best special, what I love in Star Trek uh, is when they had really good makeup effects. I prefer to see that. Um, I think if they had a little bit more of a budget, they could pull that off. Um, it all depends. I don't want to see them CG it. Well, I mean, you're also see, talking... Not CG the deep. aliens. They're going to CG the ships, and they're going to CG the environments, and a lot of the other stuff, but I don't think they're going to CG the, the people. Yeah, but you're also talking TV-level quality, so you don't want to see TV-level quality you know cg either i mean they've done that in the history of star trek they've been they they had th- they had cg effects for a while they use them pretty liberally i would say most of the time uh but you know it, i I'm, I'm interested in seeing a new star trek series i think everyone's ready for a new star trek series i would watch it every week i think there are plenty of trekkies who tried to watch it it just all depends uh i think the trick is they have to get somebody who's really driven I think J.J. Abrams expressed interest, and I think he could possibly do something am- amazing with it. Take somebody who's like really good at building universes and stories, give them give them the project, and let them go. Speaking of fandoms that I'm really passionate about, um, we're about to talk about another fandom that a lot of people have been getting passionate about over the last you know couple of years, uh, which is which is My Little Pony. Friendship is magic. My little pony, my little pony. Ah. All right, so we're about to talk about My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. Um, we're going to try and give a short introduction about... Let me just talk about the show for a second. Um, so, so for those little pony idiots that magic. don't know, what is My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic? does make you an idiot not to know. It's not as big as you think, that. Well, uh, so <laughs> Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. 
uh, of course, is a continuation of the uh, of the class. Oh, I, would, I want to say almost classic, probably just nostalgic. Um, Hasbro uh, toy and cartoon line, My Little Pony from the '80s. That you know they've had several series around, um, and this is probably the series that has had the biggest splash, probably since the original. And uh, it's basically about uh, six girls or ponies live, that live in a small village in the in uh, in Equestria, and they solve all kinds of problems that usually are related to friendship and learn lessons. And that sounds pretty pretty uh, much like all the other My Little Pony series, except there is one thing that kind of makes sets this series apart. Well, it's two things. First of all, it's that it was led by uh, Lauren Faust. Now, you want to tell us about Lauren Faust, Zach? Lauren Faust is the creator of such popular shows as, say, I don't know, the Powerpuff Girls. Well, she wasn't the. She wasn't really the creator. She was involved. With you know what? You know what? You know she what? was the creator of um, uh, the ha- what is it? The uh, House of Imaginary Friends. Uh, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, yes. There we go. And she she's worked on a lot of really amazing uh, cartoon shows over the last you know, two decades. And she'd been wanting to make a new cartoon show uh, marketed toward girls. And that's when she came up with. Uh, and that's when she was approached with this My Little Pony project. And she started making her show. But the thing is that it's so unlike any other My Little Pony show... Because she brings her brand of humor, which is kind of... It kind of stretches across all generations. And she also brings in her style and her direct... And, and the kind of... That's one of the things that, that hits that hit me about this series is that the animation is a lot better than any of the other My Little Pony series. And a lot of a lot better than a lot of other cartoon series. Well, yeah. It, this show is on The Hub, which I'm, I'm just going to say it. I believe it's the new Cartoon Network since the Cartoon Network I knew and loved kind of went down the shitter. Uh, um, I'm a little older and I still think that Cartoon Network is, uh, is pretty decent. Um, sorry. Uh, I just think that I've gotten too old for it, mostly. Like, I appreciate what's on there, like Adventure Time and Regular Show. I can see how, if I was a little younger, I would really like those shows. And I would probably watch them religiously. But um, the thing about My Little Pony is that although it is a show that is generally considered for girls, it is not the, is not the way that it has been with Friendship is Magic. Friendship is Magic has a huge cult following with guys ages what 14 to probably 14 to 30 yeah 14 to 30 and while some people may think that is very strange and weird and creepy pedo uh, gay i've been called i've been called a pedophile you know people have a lot of weird feelings about the idea of uh what was acceptable for men to enjoy uh and uh, that's kind of the subject of this documentary that we're about to talk about, which is being uh, headed by John Delancey, who played Q on Star Trek The Next Generation, as well as other series. Uh, he also plays a villain on the, the uh, My Little Pony series. My favorite Discord. Uh, character, in fact, Discord. Oh, for goodness sake! You've been kind for far too long, my dear. Time to be cruel! Arrivederci! It was basically, uh, it was funny that I, like I said, I got into Star Trek pretty much around the same time I got into Ponies, and uh, one of the draws for me was probably the season two premiere, which was that John Delancey, who I who I really liked from Star Trek, was going to be playing a character on the show, and I was like, okay, I have to watch this now, and uh, he was fantastic. I mean, that's that's the first thing I've got to say. And uh, what we're about to what we're about to talk about, and he's about to talk about in this video, and we're gonna have it linked below. We're gonna watch this sh- very short video, listen to what John Delancey has to say, and then we're gonna talk about what we think about the idea of this documentary, and what what being a brony means to us. So I'll, I'll say three, two, one, and then we can start. Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, so on the count of three, we're gonna we're gonna watch the video, and we're gonna comment a little bit, but we're mostly gonna let John Delancey talk. Thank you. Three, two, one, push. Hi, I'm John Delancey. Oh, hi, John Delancey. I've been on a lot of shows that have had some interesting fans, but never so interesting as My Little Pony. 
Some of those fans call themselves bronies, and I've been invited to the biggest brony convention in the world. It's at the Meadowlands, right outside of New York City at the end of June. This is a documentary about the fan phenomenon called bronies. That's what this Kickstarter campaign is all about. The BronyCon documentary will follow me to New York, where we will discover who bronies are and what makes them so unique. Our documentary is going to be respectful, insightful, and very entertaining. Hi, I'm Laurent Malachay, the director of this project. Some people don't understand bronies. They make fun of them, they marginalize them, they just don't get it. I'm excited to make this documentary because I believe in the message of the show, and I believe that bronies deserve a chance to show us who they really are and why they've chosen to become fans. I think there's no better way to get to know the bronies than through the eyes of John Delancey. Like the general public, he's new to this phenomenon, but he's been launched into the middle of their world. I'm excited to take this journey with John, but I'm also interested in discovering what fuels this love and appreciation for the show and how the brony community is an evolving culture. I hope you're as enthusiastic as I am because I really want to show you this journey to BronyCon. Thanks for supporting our Kickstarter campaign. All right, so as you can see, there's a Kickstarter pro, uh, campaign. We'll definitely uh, link it under the video and uh, in the article that I'm going to post on my blog. Uh, but let's let's talk about, A, the concept of this documentary, and then we can talk about a little bit what, what Bronito means to us. Okay. So I think that this is a really good documentary idea because unlike a lot of other... F I, don't, I, I, I haven't been around at the beginning of these other fandoms like Star Wars or Star Trek or anything like that. So I don't really quite understand what the uh, feeling was about those when they originally came about. Um, I know that nerds are generally kind of marginalized in general, although recently, of course, I think we're taking huge strides toward becoming more... Our, what we enjoy is becoming more accepted in popular culture. You can see that through superhero movies and uh, a lot of sci-fi and, of course, video games has become, I think, more, more appreciated over time. But, I mean, uh, yeah, nerds have really, you know, become the from the laughing stock of the school to owning the school. We now really think about this. If you are a nerd or a geek, this is the perfect time to be, yeah. you know, living. Is because I mean, you it's... have movies that are coming out that are right up your alley. You have games that are coming out that are just top notch. You have TV shows that are coming out. We'll get onto this a little later that would have never been made 20 years ago. I mean, this is just yeah. absolutely fantastic. The, the culture has changed a lot, but um, if the, I think if there's ever been a fandom that people have been more leery about, and I will defend the people that are a little bit leery about it, and I'll explain why uh, in a moment, uh, why they might be leery about it, or why they might be confused about it, um, is about is about bronies. Uh, well, first of all, um, I, I when I first heard about bronies, I didn't really have any kind of opinion about it. Uh. How do you how do you not have an opinion about it? That's I mean, when like I saying... first heard about it, like when I, oh, okay. when I like I saw people like posting videos about it or like that they enjoyed the show, I didn't really care. Because because for me, I'm, I'm I've uh, I've wanted to be a lot of things over the years, and one of the first things I ever wanted to be was a was a cartoonist and an animator. So I can't really judge people for wanting to watch cartoons. Um, I've enjoyed cartoons uh, my entire life, and I still enjoy them. And exactly. Yeah. I mean, my I can't parents, really. My parents, you know, they they think I'm like mentally ill because I still like, you know, cartoons. Well, I mean, I think I think as you do get older, they do kind of lose some of their appeal. And I, I like I don't watch them nearly as much as I used to. I used to be glued to the television. But uh, yeah, but if I, a show is good, then a show is good regardless. It doesn't matter what the topic is or how. But even it then, even then, like the show like is I good. Said, then, even yeah. like I said, there are some shows that I I don't watch as much as I might have watched if I was. Like I would uh, back then. That makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Um, but let's. So, let's talk about a so brony. A brony is a uh, a male between. It's a, it's a adult male, usually adult male or teenage male, who is a fan of My Little Ponies. Um, it can also be. Like, you can also argue that bronies can include girls. Because there are plenty of female adult fans, but I think they prefer to be called uh, what was it, Pegasus Sisters? Yes, Pegasus Sisters. I think I've heard people. I've had, I've had people uh, go on. I'll go after me about that. I per I personally prefer Brony, Bronies for all of us, but and it's just me. Um, so I think people are leery about this fandom and about the idea of adult males watching this, because it challenges the traditional concept of masculinity in a certain way. What it is is that in the past, 
uh, our cartoons have really been divided. And oh yes, very differently. You, it was either Yu Hakusho or Sailor Moon, and you know there was well, no. Real. It's, not even, <laughs> it's not even like that because at least Sailor Moon they had problems that they had to overcome. Yeah, I mean, but you, you really let's... wouldn't see a you know a group a large group of guys watching Sailor Moon. See, I would argue that anime is it, anime doesn't quite fall into that same issue. Let me explain what the what like what I was trying to get to, which is like shows like My Little Pony in the '80s or like Gem or like I don't know Hello Kitty or anything like like just like shows that were very much oriented toward girls, and you had shows that were very much oriented bo- toward boys, like Transformers and Dragon Ball Z and uh, um, Ninja, uh, Teenage Mutant GI Ninja Joes Turtles. and Ninja Turtles, right? And so the difference between those shoes, the two, main difference between these two shows, besides the color palette. <laughs> Whereas the was the the general themes of them the like in, in male shows are generally about fighting and trying to overcome an e- a big evil, and in the girl shows it was mostly about cuteness, cuteness, fluffy things, uh, stuff like that. Fashion, yeah, passion for fashion. Um, and so I think that people generally when they hear My Little Pony they think it's something like that. That's the first thing that I think people think. Um, and I generally say that the programming they make for girls just doesn't... I, I guess I can understand why a girl, a little girl might be appealed to it. But I don't think I could really put those in the same category as this show. I think most people wouldn't be too uh, concerned if an adult, like an adult male who is our age, like... If I told a, teen, a girl my age that I, I liked Powerpuff Girls, or I thought Powerpuff Girls was enjoyable, or I used to watch it, she probably wouldn't care. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, because I think Pump of Girls has stuff for uh, both audiences of male well, and I think female. It's, yeah, it's far more obvious that it's for both because in the in every trailer and everything involved, it's about you see a bunch of little girls punching bad guys. <laughs> well, yeah, so, it has that you know action aspect to it. You know, while still it, being cutesy and fluffy. I mean, hell, I went and saw the Powerpuff Girls movie. Yeah, I mean, it appeals to it appeals to both audiences. So, so I think as we were getting older, there were there were more shows that were trying to be gender neutral. Um, and I really think that that that's might be the way of the future in cartoons. But I don't know. Some people really think that you know that's the way it's got to be. I think people don't understand that what we think of as masculinity and femininity are very modern uh, ideas of those two things. First of all, mm-hmm. um, the other thing is that it's you know what it's it's perfectly okay for me to sit down and watch a show about about what what, what My Little Pony is really about for me is it's about friends that are kind of funny and they're trying to overcome some. It's usually a misunderstanding between them. So there are plenty of shows like that as we watch as kids sitcoms, kids sitcoms and stuff like that. Uh, and then it's highlighted by these really uh, there's like a lot of chase scenes and a lot of scenes involving animals, a lot of scenes involving cartoon violence. Like I think there's actually a scene where uh, Twilight Sparkle. See, I'm gonna say the names. It's gonna make me sound so silly. Uh, Twilight well, hold Sparkle. Hold on, hold on. Let's introduce our characters. We are known as the main six. M A N E six. So we have our main character essentially, Twilight Sparkle. We have Rarity, who is the fashionista. We have Fluttershy, who is the, the shy uh, girl that we shy all girl, play. but is good with animals. We have Pinkie Pie, who is you know part let's party and she's, excitement and she's not know. really a party girl. She's just a spaz. Yeah, <laughs> that's really and what then she we is. Have, uh, Rainbow Dash. Rainbow who's Dash. The cool chick. She's the she's kind of tomboyish cool chick. Very tomboyish. You know you. Then we've got Applejack, who's the who's the uh, southern the, like. Very farmer. She's, she's kind of got a tomboy thing going on. She's athletic. Um, and then we've, I think that's, yeah, that's all of them, right? Yeah, yeah it's the main six. So, so the show is, I think of you a broad range of different types of characters. Um, really, uh, I think the best episodes for me are the ones where they go pathologic. You see their, them break down into insanity. Oh, those are just brilliantly funny. Yeah. So each of the characters has a nervous breakdown in the first two seasons. That sounds like a kid show, right? Keep it together. If I can't find a friendship problem, I'll make a friendship problem. Hi, girls. Oh, hi, Twilight. How's it going? 
great. Just great. You three look like you're doing great, too. Looks like three good friends who obviously don't need the help of another good friend. This is Smarty Pants. She was mine when I was your age. And now I want to give her to you. I just hope the fact that there are three of you and only one of her doesn't become a problem. I'd hate to cause a rift between such good friends. So yeah, especially when, you know... Oh, God. I think she Twilight Sparkle, like kills a bird because yeah. her her uh she has a, a horn because she's a unicorn there <laughs> yeah she's there are three types of ponies there's the unicorns there's the uh uh just just so you know you sound just you would sound just as dorky if you were explaining uh, explaining this as you would if you were trying to explain the difference between saiyans uh namics and and uh i don't know any oh, i guess this is the only two main <laughs> alien races so, in dragon ball z Okay, so we you got, got, your, so you your, got normal, your ground ponies, which ground ponies. Horns. You got your yeah. air ponies, which have have wings, and then you have your uh, your magic ponies, which have horns and can do magic. So there's exactly. there's your three different types of ponies. So, so she, she has to uh, write a letter every week to Princess Celestia, which yeah, it's, is it's, you know, kind of you know, you know what that like reminds me overseer. of. You know how many different shows there were when we were when you were growing up where like a, the, the, the every episode would end with the main character who's usually a kid writing a letter or uh, writing in their journal. Mm -hmm. Dookie Hauser and uh, Clarissa explains it all. Oh jeez, yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot. Of, it's kind of got a feel like that. Um, but basically, she she like uh, she's trying to uh, you know make someone learn a lesson within friendship, and she's trying to force it. And there's you see the shot of this uh, bird nest, and there's a bird in it, and then her, her head sticks up to where the nest is on top of her head, and that bird never moves again. <laughs> so I think it's just scared. Um, no, if but, it was scared, it'd fly away. But you know, uh, I think a lot of people see this. Sh they they associate My Little Pony with little girls, and they associate kids shows with I don't know. But the idea that an adult male could enjoy a show like that just doesn't gel with them. I think what it is is you know this is a very stressful time we live in. Exactly. Um, I mean, but the thing is about the show, it doesn't talk down to kids. No, and you know, I, I think I think one of the appeals though is is watching it as an adult though, is that you can relate. Like, like for me, actually no, for me it's not about relating to the. I kind of relate. Everyone has like a relate, relate, to. relate to. I relate to Twilight Sparkle, but I think I think with the show, what appeals to me is the fact that it's kind of insane, but in a good way. Yeah, in a good way. But like I'm saying, the the world that they've created. It's kind. Of, it's almost. It's almost this ironic enjoyment. I want to say it's not really ironic. It's more like just like I don't enjoy it ironically. I really enjoy it, but I enjoy it for kind of an ironic reason, which is that uh, the show is about this very weird world. It's not super cutesy. It's not super cutesy. Bad things happen in this world. Um, I mean, the series starts with uh, so. So there are a lot of memes with this series, um, and one of one of them is the queen of this world, basically God. Yeah, I want to say a godlike character. Celestia. She banished her evil sister to the moon years ago, a thousand years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, the, the the series opens with uh, basically the first ep the, it's a two part of the first episode, which you don't get those little girl shows. Come on, uh, is that this evil character? Nightmare, right? Nightmare Moon. Nightmare Moon returns and is basically just gonna like. She's gonna. She's gonna have like a thousand years of darkness. A thousand years of darkness. <laughs> I mean, and come on, that's so it's tell me that's not awesome. To stop her. And the second series. So the the reason that we kind of went from Star Trek to this is the second series opens up with. Uh, <laughs> So let me explain why I think this show is insane. So I kind of, like, you get the fact that the main, that this queen imprisoned her sister on a moon for a thousand years. By the way, she did this because her sister was jealous because, okay, so the idea is that Celestia ruled during the day and uh, the, the Nightmare Moon ruled during the night. So uh, Nightmare Moon got jealous and decided to make it night all the time, and so Celestia banishes her to the moon, right? Yeah, because so, everybody plays in the day and then goes to sleep at night. So you can't, but here's the thing. It's like I kind of understand why Nightmare Moon was jealous. Exactly. 
And then it's like in the second series, we're introduced to another godlike villain. So Discord. We start with a bunch of little. So the, the main ponies are actually probably around twelve to eighteen. I've heard. I've heard people say. I want actually. Say, I want to say they're around thirteen-ish. They're, they're, teen, they're teenaged. Yeah, they're definitely teenaged because they have a lot of responsibilities that a teenager would have. I think that's oh, the yeah. main. I mean, they all but, live in their own houses. Except yeah, for, but that's because this universe is adorable. <laughs> yeah, except for uh, Applejack, who lives so, on a farm. So let me give you an example of the insanity that is this show, which is the second season. We have these little kids are going on a field trip to the to Queen Celestia's castle, and they notice that there's this really weird statue with uh, with a, a kind of chimeric creature. And they're like they 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 are lying. I think they're lying to their teacher. Or they're arguing. That's what's happening. They're arguing in front of the statue, and the teacher explains that the statue was basically this evil, the evil ruler of the land before Celestia, called Discord. He's basically cha- the god of chaos, and he's that- essentially like the Joker Satan. of this world. No, he's Satan. You want to say Joker? He's Satan. No, because the Joker does it for fun, and this guy just does it for fun. No, he did, there's that, but this but this guy is the embodiment. He's the he's like the the devil. I'm saying in terms of the celestial way that the series is run. If if Celestia is basically God, this guy is basically the devil because she casts him out. And uh, so she turned him to stone. He's been sitting in her garden for like aeons, and all it takes to break him free because he breaks free. Second season is that there's three little girls arguing in front of him. Or yeah, there are. That's that's all it takes. Is there's just discord. There's an argument in front of him. So in this universe, they would allow children to go on a field trip to a garden with a statue with an evil demigod in it, and with the knowledge that the statue would come to life if there was an argument in front of it or like something went wrong. You get you get what I'm saying. That is already that kind of insanity to the show, and then. I mean that's that, I mean, that's all it really takes is that that is that kind of like you, you're watching the show and you're going oh, that's just insane and they're all just kind of okay with it and you know there's kind of wink winks to it too they kind of the characters occasionally acknowledge how weird their world is yeah I mean they're definitely breaking the fourth wall from time to time it's I mean, it's a very the show like I said it's it's a it's very Looney Tunes esque most of the time I would say yeah and. Oh, yeah. There's lessons about friendship and there's lessons about all kinds of manners of things. But I think in general, um, what appeals to people is that it does have a sense of humor that relies a lot on visual humor and slapstick and things that you traditionally want to see in cartoons. Uh, I don't think any I don't think any of the old uh, shows really relied on that. I don't think a lot of shows rely on that today. Um, so I think that that's the appeal. Um, the voice acting is really good. I mean, the, the show is just a well-made show. I don't think I have much else to say about why I enjoy the show. I don't think... I, I can explain why I like the show. Go ahead. Well, I like the show that each character is not perfect. Each character is far from perfect. You know, our each character has their strengths and weaknesses, they're and they are flawed. They're distinguished from each other. Yeah, they're very different. They're not just, you know, fill in the blank of, you know this you know stereotype of a character almost well there's only one character that's obsessed with fashion well yeah instead but you of gotta have one show of which apparently from what i've seen they resolved almost every episode with like a makeover <laughs> <laughs> well kind of um uh but, but you know but this, uh, you know also what i like is it's writing is very clever and funny and works on multiple levels. Like you'll get the main message of the show, but then you get the subtext of the show. And, you know, I feel like as an adult, I can relate to it, Mm -hmm. you know, with my life experiences going, okay, well, I, you know, this, this episode's about peer pressure. Well, I can relate to that. And, you know, I can go, okay, well, it's nice to, you know, have a refresher course. Well, I mean, I I, I can kind of see what you're saying. I also like that uh, it has references for adults as well. There's an episode where they go to a bowling alley, and uh, you see three characters from The Big Lebowski, which there's no way in hell any kid. I mean, there's could have there's seen. a doctor. I mean, and, and and the fans have made all kinds of things. There's a Doctor Who pony, and uh, of course there's Derpy Hooves. Derpy Hooves, which is like, that's like the fandom's character. Uh, basically the. <laughs> If you want to know the kind of stuff that happens in the show, the fans got excited 
by the concept of there's this character that would show up in the background occasionally that had a had an eye that was offset. Yeah, her eyes were crossed. Yeah, her eyes look in two different directions, and she'd be in a lot of background shots, and it was really distracting. And then they in the second season they had her talk, and she kind of talked like this. Good (laughs) job, Rainbow Dash. Nice work, Rainbow Dash. They they had to uh they had to uh, cut out her voice from any future episodes, which and they uncrossed her eyes, which mm-hmm. because people were offended. Because <laughs> like one person wrote in a letter saying, "I do say," yeah, I mean they actually called her Derpy as well, so it was like super fan service. I mean, uh, it, it's kind of like a Where's Waldo of sorts in the episode. It's like, oh, oh, is she back there? Is she in the background? Oh my gosh, there she is! There she is! You know, what's oh, weird? I wonder if any kids, little kids, actually watch this show. That's actually a very good question. <laughs> I should do I some know. research. On... I don't know any little kids off the top of my head. But anyway, well, I do know. Like one time, I was at a university uh, on college, uh, you know, at college at our university center. And I was just watching the latest episode uh, in our student lounge. And there happened to be this little, you know, six-year-old, seven-year-old girl there. And she was like, is it okay if I watch that with you? And I was like, absolutely. Though very uncomfortable as a, you know, as a look, you know, you got this 20-year-old guy watching this pony show with this little seven-year-old girl. What is he, a pedophile? You know, I felt like I was able to... You know, it was you know great to watch something and enjoy something with someone that young. Yeah, I mean that's uh, you know it, it, that you that, know, that broad there's demographic. appeal there to watching right. to watching a show with a kid. You know, it's it's nice. It's the same but, thing uh, with like Pixar films, to where yeah, they're oh, for yeah. kids, but they're also for adults. It's that same thing, and I do not understand. It's like nobody rags on Pixar for that, but oh, well, My Little think, Pony, let's just thing, jump would, on that shit. To be fair, I don't think that My Little Pony has quite the. Uh, appeal of a, I don't think it has quite the mass appeal of a Pixar film well, I don't think it is quite as intelligent as a Pixar film no it's, no but uh, I can see what you're saying is it, it is entertainment for all ages I think that uh, what I'd like to take away from this is if if you have any interest in the concept of this show um, I would say you should definitely just try and watch a couple episodes and uh, another thing that'll if you if you're interested is uh, check out some AMVs and things, you know, different videos on the on the internet, because um, that's how I got into it. Is I watched a couple of uh, AMVs, and uh, if if it interests you, that's great. If it doesn't, that's also fine. Um, I think I mean, that's. Just, but the main part is just give it a chance and just you know watch you know three episodes. Just give it a, the three episode chance. See, I wouldn't even push it that far. Um, I wouldn't push anybody that far for anything. Really? Uh, what I would think you one do? Of the one major... or two. Well, you know, I think one of the major things is even within our own community of nerds, which are generally pretty accepting, is that uh, the – I mean, I think we're pretty accepting of each other, I think, in general. I think yeah, nerds are generally accepting is that, um, is that they, they don't like when people try to pr- provoke them into doing something. So I wouldn't say – I like, personally, I'd, I, I wouldn't like if someone was trying to push me to watch a show if I wasn't interested in it. So I'm not going to tell anybody to go do that. Well, for me, it's like, you know, just see what it is before, because most of my friends make fun of me well, my main, for yeah, the main thing uh, is, watching should, it. I would say you shouldn't judge somebody for watching it. Um, it's not a dumb show. Uh, it, like, do not, well, let me say this, do not judge uh, a Pony fan if you watch reality TV. I'm going to love and tolerate the shit out of you. Yeah. Um, well, anyway, uh... I think we're going to end this little part of this discussion with a little bro-hoof, uh, digital bro-hoof, Zach. Bro-hoof. Here, here, let me type it out here. Bro-hoof. All right, so... <laughs> bro-hoof. All right, so the next the next uh, discussion we're going to be talking about is Game of Thrones. Yay. Alright, so let's talk about Game of Thrones. Now, here's the warning, everybody. Now you're looking for the secret. You're trying to see this coming? No. But you won't find it because, of course... You're not going to see this coming. You're not really looking. I have been puzzling over how it works. You 
you don't really want to work it out. Who's in the box? I have been dying to tell you. I want to tell you my secret. You want to be fooled. This is the best show on television that I have seen. Now, I haven't seen Breaking Bad, and I haven't seen, um, you know, some Breaking of the other... Bad. You know, some of the other uh, shows people claim to be the best show on TV. But for me, this show was so good, after watching three episodes, I bought the Blu-ray. And I never buy TV shows. So that yeah. should say something. Yeah, this is probably the best show on television. It's HBO. Um, even HBO's bad shows are entertaining. Yeah. I mean, I watched two seasons of True Blood. No lies. So, <laughs> I guess... <laughs> So I guess we should start off by saying, uh, how did you come across this show? Um, I think the first thing I, I, I think I'd heard about the series before, the book series. And then I was, like I said, I, I used to watch True Blood. <laughs> uh, I used to, funnily enough, I used to watch it with my mom. Because uh, we, it, it, I enjoyed it because it was dumb. Um... And at the end of, I think at the end of the second season or the third season, uh, they showed a promo for this new show called Game of Thrones that was going to be coming up. And it had Sean Bean and that it was, it was a, you know, a fantasy medieval uh, TV series. And then I was like, well, okay, I'm in the, I'm, I'm, I'm on this like, you know, like grits. And so I, I was definitely, I, I went out and bought uh, the first four books. Which I read, I read the first book, and uh, I I enjoy the books, but they're a little long and dry at parts. But that's the TV interesting because I'm reading the first book right now. The TV series, on on the other hand, I think is is pretty a pretty good interpretation of the books, and I think it's it like you said, it's probably one of the best shows on television right now, if not of all time. Of all time? Of all time. At least for this genre. <laughs> <laughs> for uh, for me, the way I came across it was, I remember listening to the Slash Film podcast last summer, and they were talking about episode 8, no, episode 9, called uh, Baylor. And, okay, spoilers, last chance. They were talking about the death of of a major character uh essentially like the main character of the show okay so now so now so now that we all have gotten past the spoilerific shit you know they were talking about ned stark's death and sean bean getting killed off so uh that kind of interested me i was like wow a show that could you know take risks i should probably in you know get into this so i went to my on-demand uh thing this is back when we had hbo last summer on demand and they had like the first three or four episodes on demand and um on demand yeah so i i watched the first one and i was like holy shit that just picked me up by my feet and drug me a mile and i enjoyed every second of it that was absolutely great well let me watch a new episode i enjoy game of thrones i wouldn't say i enjoy every second well, I think I think what the real appeal and the secret of the show is that like a lot of shows that I think that HBO is trying to do, um, it it does it has an ensemble cast which is very much like the books, which the books oh, all take place well, from the perspective of various characters, of various ages and ver- like so each chapter takes place from different characters' perspective. I mean this show is like Twitter. There's 160 characters and bad things are constantly happening. Yeah. Um, you know. I, I and never and no one is safe. No one is safe. Absolutely not. It's like, oh yeah, you like this character? Fuck you. We're killing him. I mean, the show will really do that. And um, I only got three episodes in before our subscription to HBO ended, but I was very much interested in it, and I really, really wanted the the Blu-ray to watch the whole uh, series. So this past uh, February, I believe it was, the Blu-ray price went down to like $35, which if you don't know, $35 for a five-disc set is like a steal, especially yeah. when the reviews started coming yeah, out yeah. saying it's like one of the best Blu-rays ever from HBO. So I picked that up, and then I, I watched the whole season in I think about four days, and mm-hmm. I got my roommate into it, and he loved it more than me. So, I am completely hooked. I've got the first and second book 
I'm reading through the first one, and I just I just love this show so much. Yeah, and you know uh, the author uh, George R. R. Martin. Just for a quick uh, interest, a few interesting things I want to say about him before we uh, we're gonna watch a short clip from the show, and then we're gonna talk about the whole series. Is that uh, George R. R. Martin has been a fantasy writer for a long time, and he's worked on a lot of interesting projects. For example, he worked with uh, George Lucas on Star Wars. Really. And he uh, actually had a lot to do with the creation of the Wookiees, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, he also one of the things I'd read a while ago was he wrote he wrote letters when he was a, when he was a lot younger. He wrote a lot of letters to uh, famous authors and, and writers. Uh, he wrote a letter to Stan Lee where he complained that the Fantastic Four didn't have enough good villains. And he, well, and, he's got and, a point there. Well, this is like when he was a teenager, and so he wrote like he was like he was like Fantastic Four doesn't have enough good villains, good sir. Like he was speaking with like he's speaking very you know, uh, punctuated, uh, and precociously, and, and yeah, and and proper at the same time. He's like uh, the only the only villain I could think of that had a had an interesting story was the Mole Man. <laughs> and like it was it was very interesting to read this guy. He like he knew about writing like that so well. Um, and I'm a writer as well. I'm an aspiring writer, and uh, a lot, I think that one of the authors I'm trying to take away some skills from is definitely this guy because he 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 knows how to write some good characters. And I really think that's what this series is about. Is it's about characters. And I think um, if there's anything I would say, this show is not for it's not just for fantasy fans. And on, it, that's probably one of if you're if you're into fantasy just for fantasy and just for magic, this series does not have a lot of it. Yeah, I mean, so it's, far. Like, it's like the fantasy elements of, like, Lord of the Rings and, you know, uh, uh, witches and magic. Yeah, all that shit said, f*** this, and went up north. And there's like, there's it like hasn't no been around for a thousand years. And no dwarves. And it's, yeah. it's, it's very, it's all humans. Uh, we've only seen maybe three or four instances of magic so far. Yeah, and that's what I really like about it. In, the, like, in two seasons, which have taken place over, like... A year. a year or two in the series yeah i mean uh what i like about this is magic is very special because it's not used as much i mean think about this in harry potter at the last well, harry some potter people book, don't even... were you amazed that they were doing magic well, well people no. don't even believe in magic and well you know that's one of the things i'll say about about before we continue is i'll say about harry potter one of the things i've always liked about harry potter was that while magic was everywhere um, they didn't. It wasn't as grand as it was in the movies, and that was kind of what I liked about it was that it, it, what, for them it was commonplace. But uh, for for this series, it's the total opposite. Magic is extremely rare. Most people don't believe it exists. When it happens, it's a people, big deal on the people, show. You know, all the dragons have been killed. Yep, Sorry, there were, these things. Is magic existed for sure? Yeah, he got tired and said everybody knows magic north. existed, but they don't know if it exists anymore. I guess is the is one of the major themes. Um, but yeah, it's it's mostly it's mostly a political sh it's a political it's almost like a, I want to say a political drama about all these different oh, it individuals. It's an action show, it's a war show about all these individuals who are kind of conniving against each other. Um, it is it's a game of thrones. Well, it's you like... know, it's a direct it's a direct analog of the War of Roses. Um, if you didn't know that, uh, it's. Uh, the uh, the houses of Stark and Lannister versus the house it's they're very similar to the houses of uh, York and uh, was houses yeah the, the point is that it takes it they borrow a lot from history um, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna watch a, a short from uh, one of the last uh, episodes of season two I think it was the was the Black episode Water. Blackwater which was a fantastic episode absolutely stunning episode probably throughout my favorite the, episode of the second season probably well, let me explain this for a second throughout the show what it usually does is it goes from character to character to story to story so one you know it'll spend 15 minutes in winterfell and the story of bran and then it will switch you know 2000 miles away to the story of daenerys over the sea and her conquest but for this episode it was the sole battle of Blackwater well, I mean, at King's Landing. It, it took never place switched. with all the characters that were there. It did switch perspectives. Yeah, it switched perspectives, but but it was left. all taking place. It never in left King's Landing. Yeah, it yeah. never left kept King's Landing, which the show has never done before. So this was special in itself. So set, to set up the speech, basically the battle is about uh, 60% uh, the way done, and everybody's 
thinking, uh, okay, f this shit. Stannis can have the city. Well, I after I... their their big yeah their big uh, weapon of mass destruction uh, didn't completely. Yeah, I mean, win it, it, it them. crippled them, but it didn't kill them, and they were kind of depressed that it didn't all kill them. But uh, so uh, what happens to set up uh, the queen? Cersei has requested that the evil conniving fucking of a king. You're talking uh, about Malfoy. No, Malfoy's nice compared to this bad. Yeah, I know. I've I've said I've said that, but he's he's basically like Malfoy. If you miss like Malfoy and I don't even know, like Satan. <laughs> no, Satan. Like Satan would look you know what it is? Goes, it's, Dude, it's calm it's down. Mal it's Malfoy. It's Malfoy and uh, I can't even think of a good um, Hannibal Lecter. I don't know. No, it doesn't even look like that. Just eat people and kill them. This yes, it's a little prick. This bastard. He gets hookers for his birthday. He decides, I want you. He tells one hooker, I want you to beat the other one. With a mace. With a fing mace. Or I'm going to hold you at crossbow point. Okay? That is. Oh. Yeah, and he's like. And that's what, not even the worst 15? thing he's done. He's like 15? 16? Something uh, like that? 16, something like that. He's very young and uh, very, very evil. So, you know, he's, he's a bit of a pussy. He, oh, he's a pussy too. So uh, to set up the scene, uh, he's just now getting word to fall back into his chambers, which for a king to do that, it's kind of bad. So oh, it's kind of awful. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like your leader saying, well, fuck all y'all. I'm going to go be safe. Yeah, I don't think the wall's going to stay, so I'm going to so run. A midget, I'm sorry, dwarf, uh, Tyron. Uh, Tyrion. Tyrion, sorry. Tyrion. Played by the amazing Peter Dinklage, the Ag the just... Academy Award winning Peter, not Academy Award, sorry, Emmy Award winning <laughs> Peter Dinklage. Yes. He is trying to rally everyone together. So you ready to play this clip here? Oh, yeah. Okay, so we'll again, his little his little speech. Yeah, and this was just a landmark of this episode. So, again, he, we're including the audio. So... You Three. can listen on the long. We're probably going to comment a little bit, but we'll mostly let him speak. Yeah. All right. So, Three, two, two, one, push. Heave! The queen sent me to bring you back to the Red Keep. Me? If you won't defend your own city, why That's should they? That's What no, would you have Tyrion. me do? Tyrion. Lead. Tyrion, sorry. Get down there and Tyrion. lead your people against the invaders who want to kill them. What did my mother say exactly? Did she have urgent business with me? She did not say, Your Grace. Does she have urgent business with me? Sir Boris, Sir Mandan. I'm out. Stay with my uncle and represent the king on the field of battle. Yep, you sure look like me. This will work. This is why all kings. Screw you guys. I'm going home. This is why all kings need a double. <laughs> Twice as often seen. Screw you guys, I'm going Oh, rocks! No! My own rocks! The other one is moving! Talking! So you see these guys lining up here, and the other, the bad guys are, you know, they're having a Helm's Deep moment where the orcs are on the other side of this. But well, you know, the, the thing is that despite the fact that some of them were scared, team. people did come up to the wall. I'll leave the attack! Because they realized something was happening. Hold my hand. So up to this point, everyone in the series has hated this guy. Just so you know. Men form up. They call him the imp. Men. Men. <laughs> yeah. I am half a man. But what does that make the lot of you? The only way out is through the gates, and there aren't the gates. There's another way out. I'm going to show you. Come out behind them and f them in their asses! Yeah. Don't fight for your king! And don't fight for his kingdoms! Don't fight for honor, don't fight for glory! Don't fight for riches because he won't get any! This is your city Stannis means to sack! That's your gate he's ramming! If he gets in, it will be your houses he burns! Your gold he steals, your women he will rape. Those are brave men knocking at our door. 
Let's go kill them. Yeah. Like a boss. I think we can do the button here. So he goes and leads the men like a pimp. Imp like a pimp. Yeah. So I mean, that was a serious highlight for that episode. Uh, in, a, in an episode full of awesome, like that, I've heard that apparently they that was one of those most expensive episode out of all the episodes. Yeah, they put like ten million dollars into that single episode. Yeah. I mean, and it shows. It shows on screen. Those are because it's sets. HBO. Those are real sets. Because those it's are HBO. real men in armor. <laughs> those are real special effects. You know, you know, Great it's special HBO. Effects. You know, HBO, as awful as that True Blood TV show is, I enjoy it for ironic reasons, I'm not going to lie. As awful as it is, and as, as cheesy as it is, is, and as, as trashy as it is, it has better special effects than uh, than Twilight. Oh god, what movie doesn't have better special effects? <laughs> and it's on TV, and and they, they put out like, you know, 10 hours of it a year, so... Yep. That's... Uh, uh, so let's talk about... Let's talk about... Uh, the so let's talk about this season because I don't want to get bogged down last season. Yeah, I mean we you, you know you know you know first season first season's good. Uh, let's just have a bit of a setup here. First season we're introduced to all of our characters or ninety percent of them. And yeah, we get a couple new characters in this season. Yeah, so the the king Robert uh, dies on a hunt, and uh, Edward, Edward finds out that basically uh, King Joffrey, who is that little. C- is the ancestral offspring of Cersei and Jamie Lannister, both brother and sister, who are also the people that crippled his uh, his uh, his his son because he discovered that they were having an ancestral relationship. And when he goes to present the court this evidence, well, uh, he, he the thing is that the main character, the main character, the, the main ish character, Ned Stark. He is so honor bound and so goody good and so like to all my D and D fans out there, lawful good. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's like he's the hand of the king. He can't run. He has to walk everywhere. Well, yeah, to look offered, professional. He gets offered by several people to help betray, uh, to betray the the the, the prince. Mm-hmm. And when he tries to present the evidence, uh. They is, rip up. They beat the crap out of him. They kill all his men. Uh, they take him to. Uh, he's gonna hang. For, he's gonna die for his crimes. And well, the thing is, he had wishes from King Robert of what to do, and Cersei just rips them up and says, "Well, we have a new king now." Yep. And that's the moment where I was like, "You bitch." I mean, that's the way with a lot of the characters. Everybody's. You know, it's hard to tell what the. Uh, what the uh, motivations are? What some some of the characters' motivations are, which we can talk about a little bit when we get into the se- talking about season two. Um, but you know, it ends with that character Ned Stark getting his he gets his head cut off, he gets to put up on a post, and that's it. And it's not so, even that he gets his head cut off; he he agrees to admit to being a traitor in exchange for his life, in exchange for uh, returning home, in exchange for basically. A kind life of in doing exile. What he wanted to do. Well, he yeah. was exchanging it for a life in exile on the Night's Watch. That's right. He was going to get to the Night's Watch, and his family would be left alone, and it would all be fine. And Prince well, Joffrey, the prince, the prince wouldn't have that. Or sorry. Yeah, Prince no. Joffrey was like, well, since I'm a conniving little, c- uh, Sir Illyn brings get him. his head. Get him! And so they cut off his head. And uh, meanwhile, thousands of miles away, uh, basically. Uh, across the sea, you have this 13-year-old girl uh, being married to a uh, leader of a tribe and basically learning how to uh, bring her self-confidence out until well, her husband it, it accidentally gets infected Yeah, it basically ends dies. with her, her giving birth to three dragons. Yeah, she decides to go into the funeral pyre with uh, her husband... Which is one and of the with, first magic moments. Yeah, there are couple, with these I think three there are probably a couple of the really small ones in the first season, but that's yeah, a with big these one. three dragon eggs. So the next morning, when they go to look at the remains, she's sitting there naked with these three dragons. She turns out to be a descendant of the. Well, uh, well everybody knew that she was a descendant of them. Yeah, but a real descendant, well, uh, I mean, to where fire cannot kill her. 
yeah, we'll, we'll get into talking about Daenerys in a second. So there's that going on, and then the other That's big story is it. that winter is coming. Yes, winter is coming. Which is the, the tagline the, of the entire series. Well, they say in the middle of the season, it's finally the end of the summer. The summer has been going on for nine years. Yep. Oh, yeah, and this that's one of the big things about this universe is that the seasons are different. They last for years. So when winter comes, you better have enough food or people are going to be eating each other alive. Yeah, winter's a big deal. And uh, meanwhile, the... the so the idea is that this entire country is bordered up at the at the north by this giant wall that protects them from uh, essentially the fantasy elements, barbarians. Yeah, and, the fantasy elements. And then the other fan the fantasy elements that most people don't believe in, and it's horribly undermanned. And uh, we'll get into what that means in the second season. And one of the other main characters, Jon Snow, is he's he's joined that uh, the guards that live up there. He's the bastard. Yeah, the Night's Watch. Start course as you know if you're probably listening to this and uh so he goes up north that's where the second season kind of ends and so the first season so the second season is about war basically is breaking out over this it's kind of like the initial bout of wars that's going to break out over um the crown because we have these different sides that i want the crown so of course we have the 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 king who's sitting on the iron throne which is king joffrey who is hateable, hateable, hateable. Which is the thing, no matter what side you're on in any of the stories, there's at least one likable character. So, for example, yeah. on, on Joffrey's side, more or less, is his uh, his uh, his uncle, Tyrion. Who is extremely likable in this season. Um, you know what? Another character I thought was likable, was almost likable, was, uh, was the grandfather. Almost. Well, yeah, Tyron. He is yeah, very likable for me. Yeah, he has with uh, Arya. Every kind of get, scene like, the, with her is just fantastic. Because you see, fantastic. like, his fatherly side. So you kind of you kind of sympathize with him mm -hmm. a little bit more. And you also see that he's, he, he thinks that everyone else is an idiot. <laughs> Which I think – and one of the things in Game of Thrones is we like all we like characters that, that recognize that almost everyone else is an idiot. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Although he's a bit of an idiot too. So. Well, he has his moments. <laughs> so so we have the Lannisters, then we have the Starks, and the Starks, uh, we have our good old Rob. And Rob is basically the new goody good. I'd say he's easily the most he's the most good character out of all the characters. King of the season. North. Yeah, I'd say, does that make sense? Yeah, uh, he does I, I make can't... mistakes. I mean, he's in the in the book. Yeah, he he's makes supposed some to be, mistakes. What, yeah, he does make some mistakes, but he's young, and but he's he's young and he's idealistic and he's kind and he's generous and he's honorable and yada yada yada, right? Now the the thing about this, uh, the second book is called a Clash of Kings. Yeah, so it's so, about so we have the king and the, so we have the king and we have the king, King Joffrey. King Joffrey. We have which everyone's trying to say he's not legitimate because he's a bastard, which he is. Which he is. Uh, then we have uh, King of the North, Rob. King of the North, which is Rob Stark, and basically all he wants or says he wants is to be king in the North <laughs> and get revenge for his father's death. Yeah. Uh, he wants, you know, Joffrey's head on a spike, and hey, I'm all for that. So he's kind of thrown again into this into this situation. He's not really that ambitious necessarily. At least that's what we've seen so far. He more or less he just wants to be like his dad. He, that's what he really all he ever wanted with life. He was totally content with that. Um, and then we have uh, we have Stannis, who's introduced in the second season. Stannis Baratheon, which is the true heir to the throne. Yes. Technically, technically he is the true heir to the throne because he is the oldest brother of the king who died, making him the only legitimate blood relative. Although, if you know anything about history, that's never a good enough uh if people yeah, are willing to fight over it they're gonna fight over it yeah, he's and, kind of a dick too oh of course he is he's 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 awful i mean for everything we haven't seen him do a good thing all season yeah you got and of course there. he's running around with it with with one of the magical characters who's a crazy ass red sun worshiping biatch yeah ironically the 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 god of light is a god of fire and destruction Bullshit. And and, and 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 vagina ghosts and vagina and ghosts. Then we've got Daenerys, who 
Personally, I don't really like Daenerys for a couple of reasons. I didn't like her when she was with the dude that she was with. Um, what's his name? Uh, Carl Drogo. I didn't like Drago. I don't like her. I don't like their relationship. I think a lot of people are critical of that relationship in the book. It's about a, a chick who, like, 13, she's sold to a dude. He rapes her. <laughs> well, in the book, it's not re necessarily rape. That's where it's the show... It's still very hard to sympathize with that, like, <laughs> to, to appreciate that relationship. Yeah, um, you got a point, but in the show, it's really hard it's to rape. appreciate because she kind of has this sense because... Her family was the rulers uh, before the last war. She kind of has the sense that she deserves to rule, even though she's never stepped foot on that on that continent. Place. It's like yeah, it's like me saying she, yeah, I, I deserve to rule Europe. Yep, and never she doesn't really have an. And the beginning of the, by the like the second or third episode of the season, she's got nothing besides the dragons and like four people. <laughs> yeah, by the end. Yeah, by the end of the series, by the end of the second season, she has, or she has the dragons, she has enough gold to buy a ship, and she has like four or five guys. It's not really an invading force. Well, the dragons are pretty awesome, as we saw when they burned the uh, the the sorcerer to death, or the warlock yeah, in the House of Undying. I did not expect that to happen. <laughs> well, <laughs> quick... it, it's kind of like this up earlier in the season that the dragons were learning to breathe fire. So they could like cook yeah. their own meals. So enough time passes to where anti, you know. But it was so like anticlimactic because you're like expecting to have some big fight with this guy or this character. Nope. Introduced. Nope. She fucking just what burns she, the motherfucker oh, like Drogo and like the dragon just burned the shit out of him. And he's like, <laughs> God damn it! So we got that going on. Now she's going to go. She's going to go to Westeros, which I'm really wondering what they're going to do with her. Because I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> well, we do. Know that <laughs> That's really how next... I feel about it. We do know uh, that the next uh, season is going to be the first half of the third book. Yeah. Yeah. So oh. they are kind of pulling a Harry Potter, but it's for a reason. I mean, that you know, the that third they book is they haven't talked about everything that happened in the second book. Exactly. So I am glad that they are like more of a. Time. It's more of like a Return of the King slash Harry Potter thing. Yeah, I mean, it's not like Twilight where it's, hey, we're going to spend 50 f***ing minutes on a wedding and do nothing. They don't, they don't, waste, they don't waste a lot of time. Um, but yeah, so, uh, of course, the other the other contender for, for the king is dead, which was uh, the other brother, uh, Rang. Oh, uh, yeah, he was looking to be you know the huge guy versus stannis and then it like five minutes into episode five they're like oh well fuck you we're killing you off he gets like, killed by a vagina ghost he like within the first five minutes that's what yeah. shocked me it's, it's like oh you're dead it's like <gasps> there goes our token what? Gay. there goes our token gay king yeah that was kind of awesome. there's still other gay characters but that was our token gay king he's dead he died. His brother killed him with a vagina ghost. So, <laughs> and then his 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 wife to be, who's obviously going to become a major player in season three, is now betrothed to marry Joffrey. Yeah. So that's the big play is going to be what's what is Sansa going to do? She got offered to leave at like three like three times the last two episodes. Well, that's the thing. It's like, girl, it's time to accept defeat and get the fuck out of king's landing i was confused when when you know i thought she left with the hound <laughs> well I, yeah i mean I, she does you know offer. i saw that scene i watched that scene and i literally just was like i was so ready for her to accept that that i just kind of didn't pay attention to what happened in the rest of the scene <laughs> <laughs> and so when i just saw her in court and the next episode i was like what no, no. why did she say all right, so what do I think of season two? Um, I think uh, season two was pretty good. Um, I did, I did kind of feel like I was losing my my pacing in watching the series around the midpoint of the season, but it didn't take very long for me to get back on track. Um, <laughs> kind of a funny thing is I can't. I always think I, this is a series I always think of when I'm cutting my grass because I was like cutting my grass and I'll start thinking about all the different things that could happen. Um, 
if I had to say I had a, if I had th any favorite characters, it would definitely be uh, Tyrion is obviously the, the easy fan favorite. Uh, then Arya, which Arya ran, ran around killing people this season and generally just being awesome. Um, yeah, she was the queen of B for a long time. Yeah, she was she was pretty pretty awesome. Um, I'm pretty excited to see what, you know, I kind of wanted her to go with the assassin guy. <laughs> well, is he a, a shapeshifter? Because he was able to change his face in two seconds. I didn't see that happen. Did that happen? Yeah, he was like, oh, that person, uh, you know, you, you speak of no longer exists, and he looks away, and he turns back, and he's a completely different guy. Yeah, I guess. I didn't see that part. I mean, he was just wearing a mask. I don't know. I just I just know I really enjoyed that. I, I, I kind of enjoyed that. I wish more had happened with her character this season, but I guess, you know... Apparently, on the books, there was a lot less... Rob didn't have that much going on. But they definitely gave him a lot more of a character arc in this. Um, neither did Cersei. They gave him a lot more of a character arc. I think... Um, I think what I will say is you do feel sympathetic for a lot of the characters. Even most of the bad ones. Um, and I think one of the major things is I'm still really wanting to know the motives of all the characters. And I think that uh, Tyrion really summed it up well before the battle when he was talking to uh, the spider. Mm -hmm. When he says that, uh, what is it that you want? He, that's, that's what he asked him. He, asked, he just asked him, what is it you, what do you want? Because everybody wants something, right? And he doesn't really give an answer. I mean, like he—I I think he said something about the the city being safe or something. I don't know. I mean, the point is that that there's still several characters that their their true ambitions, like what is their ultimate goal, is still very very vague. Um, obviously, the spider, um, his ambitions are very vague. Remember, we saw him talking in the first season with somebody about something very secretive, right? Yeah, and. Did, I mean, did, I think they're going to. I think with they're Ned going. Ned Stark's death was was he like that? We we know he knew it was going to happen more or less. But was he involved with that whole spiel? Is he is he a bad guy or a good guy? It's very left. It very it's left very ambiguous because well, I, think, I think people he, want him to be a bad guy because he's the eunuch and you know he's he's supposedly a pedophile, which we haven't had any solid evidence of that yet. Yeah. Um. It, um it's. So I mean, there's it's there's difficult to there's, say. Then there's uh, Littlefinger, which I think in the series it seems like they really want Littlefinger to be a lot less likable than he is in the books. Yeah, because I mean I haven't read well, it. I, I liked yet. it the first season, but by the by the end of the, the by the by like the second or third time you see him in the second season, you just start hating him. Well, you didn't like the moment where he wiped the, the cum off that woman's face and then offered her as a, a makeup prize to that guy, and they instantly start making out. Well, you know, he's, oh. he's a pimp. <laughs> I know, he's but that moment us. just made me, oh. He's funny, but, I mean, like, he's also, like, what is his, you know, he he did the trade, Ned Stark. Yeah, he did. He, and he's conniving like that, but what is his ultimate goal? It is, it's not clear. Um, The other characters that you're not so sure about, I'd say, like, what is their, what is their goal? Uh, I guess Tyrion's goal is just to try to, like, he kind of lays it out that he just wants to kind of save the city. Yeah, right? I mean, he, he doesn't want to. And he enjoys the game. That's the that's the thing is that he enjoys the game. It's it's full of awful people, but it's the only thing he's good at. You know. Yeah, I mean, he he you know he even says that he says I don't want to leave. You know, this is a lot of fun to me. Yeah, this is all these awful people everywhere, and I just kind of enjoy being around these awful people kind of feel sorry for him in that moment uh yeah um but if i had to say there was any t moment that i liked my favorite moment in the second season is probably going to be the battle it's probably the, the favorite episode is the battle of, of the uh what was it uh blackwater yeah blackwater that's probably my favorite episode um there's a lot of things that are really cool in that episode, I think. Um, if there's a least favorite moment, it's it's probably going to be the vagina ghost. 
Well, that scene uh, was just a completely what the fuck moment. I think the problem, like, yeah, I think that's an example for me. It's an example of where, you know, just because it happens in the book and just because you're HBO, you don't have to do it. You Wait, can, I didn't know what to, you know, make of it. I was just I like, what just I think fans could have got over it if, if she just, like, summoned a, a, a black thing instead of having to do that. Like, you know, like she summoned just summoned it instead of having it come out of there. Mm-hmm. We didn't have to see all the grisly details. Um, that's an HBO. They're going to do... They're going to... That's one of the things is HBO is always going to play with that. As new, they're going to play with nudity and sex and violence because they can because why not? I mean, come on. You gotta keep people interested some way. Yeah, and you know, with that, I have to say that, uh, that's, that's pretty much it, is Game of Thrones. It's, it's full of bad people and violence and death and betrayal and sex and, and just all kinds of pretty awful and pretty interesting things. And it's the only thing that I, I enjoy watching on TV. <laughs> to know that there is another year until the next season is... Brutal. That's, that's like, whoa. That's going to be good, tough. Hey, but you know what's between that? That can, that can help me? Hmm. The Hobbit. Yeah, we got The Hobbit, Walking Dead. Well, I'm saying... Django well, Unchained, Dark Knight Rises. Yeah, but no, no, none of those... I'm, I was saying just in terms of the fantasy thing. I'm gonna enjoy. Oh, because because I because because Walking Dead I don't care about. Um, that's a cool story, bro. <laughs> that's I cool, bro. That. I think with that we're gonna end our podcast. Um, it was a little meandering there at the end. Uh, Deal with it. But deal with it, guys. Um, we're it's trying late. our best. It's late. I don't know it's if late. it's late. We're trying to... But we're recording, and it's currently 1.14 a.m. Yeah, we're both pretty tired. Um, as, All right, guys. So we're going to say uh, goodbye. Um, we're going to try and get this up as soon as possible. And this. if anybody uh, out there is interested in being a guest, all you really got to do is, like I said, I kind of posted on Facebook earlier, if you've ever had an interesting conversation with me or we've ever held an interesting conversation about video games or movies or television and you think you have a general good idea of what's in the popular zeitgeist, um, then I think that you should definitely uh, offer your services as a, as a guest. We're li- definitely looking for guests. Uh, two is great, but three is better. Three is all. all right, guys. Uh, so where can uh, we find you, Sean? Like I said last week, and like I'll say every week, you can find me and anything about... You pretty much find anything about the kind of things we talk about on Dumbledore, Shot First, Blogspot.com. Uh, you can find me, Zach Martin, on Facebook. Uh, you can also find me on YouTube, which is probably where some people might be listening, uh, Space Mountaineer 91 And you can also find me on my blog, which I still have yet to update. I may do that eventually. Uh, sanity of a college student at uh, dot blogspot dot com, and uh, you yeah. can also oh I also remember this you can also hear me on uh, the Cinegeek webcast occasionally, and you can hear me on the Fabrish Factor podcast, uh, which there should be a we actually recorded tonight the Prometheus Game of Thrones uh, episode so double dose of Game of Thrones for me. Uh, maybe that's why you were talking. I just, I just, I'm so tired. I had to work five hours. All right, all right, guys. I think we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna call it a night. I've got to go, uh, gotta go make some magic cards. Night. <laughs> See you later, everybody.